everybody, welcome to another episode of Soc 214. This is the second part of the classic social theorist uh, lecture where we're going to talk about a famous conflict theorist and a famous symbolic interactionist theorist. The famous conflict theorist is a guy you might have heard by the name of Karl Marx. Karl Marx, uh, people sometimes freak out when you're going to talk about Karl Marx because they don't understand what the guy was all about. Uh, he's been widely used and abused around the world, and there are people who feel like if you talk about Karl Marx, you know, you must be some evil communist because he is known as the father of communism, but he's so much more than that, Karl Marx. Uh, author, beer grower, beer drinker, many things, and a prolific social theorist. And so we're going to talk about Marx as sociologist, and we'll let all the other people complain and whine about talking about Karl Marx and Karl. Uh, so Karl Marx, a German theorist born in 1818 and died in 1883, lived a pretty long time, and his he was born when the ripples of the French Revolution were still sort of permeating through Europe, and it was really kind of a reflection of all that crazy change that was happening in America and Europe in the 19th century. And there's so much to talk about with regard to Karl Marx, and I studied him at length in college and graduate school, and he's, he's you know someone whose analysis is very useful in what's happening in the global economy right now. So this is what we're going to do when we talk about Marx. So there's so much we've got to squeeze a little discussion in. Uh, I took a, a philosophy of Marx class my senior year in college at Emory, 17 weeks about talking about the ideas of one person. It was amazing. It was taught by a Catholic priest, one of the best classes I've ever took. And uh, this professor taught Marx geographically, he talked about sort of the, the phases of his life and where he lived in those phases and how that influenced what became known as Marxist thought. And so I would like to do the same. I would like to talk about Marx's biography and how he sort of picked up some ideas along the way that comes to create what we think of as Marxist thought. Okay, so we're going to do this. We're going to do a little history of Karl Marx. So born in 1818 in Germany. Um, and in those days, so when he's a teenager, goes off to college and uh, studies uh, studies philosophy. Philosophy is very big in Germany uh, in the 1830s. You're just sort of in it. Uh, it's kind of like all the rage. They don't have, you know, they don't have Spotify. So what else are you going to do? They, they got very into uh, philosophers and was a philosophy major in Berlin and came under the influence of a German philosopher named George Friedrich Hegel. Hegel. Uh, and Hegel had sort of this encompassing view of the world uh, about the history of philosophy and the philosophy of history and how all things work in the world. And it was something called the Hegelian dialectic. And so we're, we in this PCC class are going to dive into the Hegelian dialectic because it really kind of blew Marx's mind, kind of like the social construction of reality blows a lot of sociologists' minds now, really became sort of a, a fascinated with this guy Hegel and his idea of the Hegelian dialectic. So here's how the dialectic work, and it works. And one of the reasons we're going to spend a little bit of time on this is it totally applies to the ch chalice and the blade. The chalice and the blade is such a great example of the Hegelian dialectic, but we're going to come back to that. So the idea of the Hegelian dialectic is everything starts in its natural state that Hegel called the thesis. And that thesis could be something really simple, like a tree. It could be a village. Uh, it's just sort of a starting point to think about a concept. But Hegel argued sooner or later, that thing, that thesis, comes into conflict with something. The conflict is a natural state of affairs. And something uh, will come to challenge that thesis that he called the antithesis or antithesis. Uh, so <coughs> for a tree, it might be a lumberjack, right? Tree growing in the woods, and here comes a lumberjack, and the tree's like, oh, shit. Uh, for the village, it might be an invading village from over the hill, right? It's going to come and conquer that village. Keep that in mind, because that's going to come into play with the ice heart. Um, and then that, that, so that's the second stage. The second stage is conflict. And then the third phase is how that thesis is transformed by the conflict, by the antithesis. And that becomes something new called the synthesis. The synthesis is sort of a new thing transformed by the conflict. So we start with a tree, thesis, lumberjack. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. Antithesis, 
chops down the tree. Now it's lumber. That's the synthesis. It's still the tree, but it's in a new form because of the conflict. We have the the village, and then as a thesis, and the invading army comes over the hill, the ant antithesis, the antithesis. Now that village is transformed by the influence of this invading army. It is the synthesis. And he argued, Hegel argued, that then that synthesis is the new thesis, and the cycle starts all over again. That conflict is transformative. And this became like a very popular idea among these uh, young philosophy majors. And, and Marx was a part of a fan club. They were called the Young Hegelians. And they would just sit around drink, drinking beer, drinking German beer, of course, uh, and applying the Hegelian dialectic to everything they could think of. So I can imagine them sitting in a, in a German beer hall, uh, and they're sitting there and they see a young Fraulein, a young lady, and like, oh, thesis. And then... Here comes a guy to talk to her. Oh, antithesis, 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 antithesis is the guy. And then they leave as a couple. Oh, synthesis. Now she's been transformed by encountering this opposing force. So that everything was dialectical. Uh, Marx, while in college, was a writer, and he was writing a lot of things that were critical of the government. At this time, Germany was run by the Prussian Empire. It was a very oppressive time in Germany. They were constantly going to war with France, and you know there was this. It was not a good time to um, be uh, somebody who cares about freedom and freedom of thought. And he was writing a lot of critical things about the government. And the government shut down his newspaper. And they said, "Shut up, young Karl Marx." It's actually a movie that came out recently called The Young Karl Marx. It's really good about all this. And so he did what a lot of uh, college students do. He took off to Paris. That's what you should do. Everybody should go if you have the means. Um, it was certainly a big part of my college experience to go off to Paris uh, because that's where all the thinkers are. So this was a Paris post-French uh, Revolution. and uh, But the French Revolution didn't exactly create this democracy that they had hoped. This was the reign of terror. This was Napoleon. This was a lot of starvation. This was a lot of people not being able to work and living in the ultimate dredges of society. If you've ever uh, read Victor Hugo's Les Miserables or seen the play Les Mis, I could sing it. The soundtrack right here. See, I told you, this one. That's Cosette. Our daughter is named after this character in Victor Hugo's uh, story. It's great. Double vinyl. Anyway, uh, it wasn't a good time to be a poor person in France. And there was this movement, uh, they were called the French Utopian Socialists, or Socialists. And it, it means a little bit different than we think of Bernie Sanders, the Socialist now. It's actually not that different. Um, but when you hear the word utopia, what do you think? I mean, what comes to mind when you hear the word utopia? Right, you think of the notion of a perfect society, right, where everybody's needs are met and people aren't starving to death and people aren't being oppressed. Well, that's what the French utopian socialists believed, that, that it was possible with all this wealth in the world to not have starvation, to not have people living in squalor. And there was a real sort of radical movement in Paris uh, in the 18, early 1840s, and Marx was like, this is awesome. You know, he came under the influence of the guy, this guy, St. Simon, and he started writing things that were very critical of the Napoleonic regime in France, and um, they didn't like it. They didn't like it. He was writing great stuff, uh, but it was critical of the government, and the government revoked his visa. They can do that, you know. Donald Trump, you know, if we've got foreign nationals here that are writing things that say Trump sucks, he's probably going to kick you out of the country because he's kind of thin-skinned, what we might call a snowflake. Um, and so uh, Mr. Marx, young Karl Marx, was asked to leave. Uh, but while in Paris, his writing gets the attention of... So this is part two. Part one is the Hegelian dialectic in Germany. Part two is while he's in Paris, it's the French socialist utopian <coughs> or utopian socialist. And while he's writing in France, he, become, he comes under the attention of a, a kind of a young... British aristocrat uh, named Frederick Engel. And Frederick Engel's dad runs all these sort of factories in northern England, these textile mills. But he's kind of this young rebel, and he wants to rebel against his dad, and really kind of falls in with Karl Marx. And it's like, man, your writing is really good. Instead of going back to Germany, why don't you come with me to England? 
because we got this sort of industrial revolution that's happening, and I think you should come and analyze it. So the step three in the sort of evolution of Marx's thought is that he goes to England, moves into London. Uh, Engels sort of sets him up. He's got a young wife at the time, Jenny, uh, Carl does, and uh, starts writing from London. But the third phase of this is he starts studying economic theory. And we think about the great economists. So you might know the name Adam Smith. Adam Smith is the known as the father of capitalism. All the great capitalistic theory that you know about supply and demand and profit margins, all that comes from Adam Smith. He was actually a Scottish uh, economist, but he was, became known as this sort of wave of British economic theory. And Marx would sit at the British Museum in London uh, and read all this economic theory. And you can go... If you ever go to London, you can go to the British Museum and sit at the desk that Karl Marx sat at, where he was sort of reading all this economic theory. And then Engels would bring him up to the north of England in places like Birmingham and let him see these factories. And these factories were dirty, filthy places, these textile mills. There was all this dust floating around from the cotton, and people were getting something called brown lung. There were children working. There were lots of immigrants working in these factories. And so in the 1840s, that's mostly Irish immigrants. Catholic Irish who were escaping the potato famine of Ireland and all they could do was come and work in these horrible factories where their arms would be ripped off and it was just horrible. And so Marx sat there in London and kind of put all this together. The Hegelian dialectic that he got in Germany, the notion of utopia that he got in France, and sort of the economic theory as applied to the life in the factory and kind of put it together and said, you know what? I'm going to take Hegel and I'm going to turn him on his head. I'm going to develop a theory about how the world works. And this theory is what we call economic determinism. And the great thing about Karl Marx is, in a way, he's the easiest theory to, theorist to understand because everything is about the money, baby. It's all about money and how money creates problems. Capitalism is the worst uh, oppressor there is. And it was all about how capitalism was making the world an ugly place with all this sort of money-grubbing, profit-driven... Anyway, so this is what ha what, how he does it. He takes a Galian dialectic, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, and applies it to human history. And he says, if you look at our... And be thinking about Eisler now. If you think about our human existence, that we have been on Earth as human beings for about 100,000 years, right? We've talked about this. For most of that existence... We've been existing in a sort of primitive communal society, hunting and gathering. People would share. People wouldn't hoard, you know, the cantaloupes that they would find or whatever they were eating. They would be like, hey, I found a cantaloupe. Let's eat. They, they would sort of share what they had in a primitive communal society, and everybody was roughly equal. And one of the things that turned Marx onto this is the stuff that was coming out of the New World. You know, when Columbus came to America, he found these people living in relative equality, and he went back to the Europeans. He's like, these people are living in paradise. And, of course, then it was like, let's just kill them all. But, uh, you know, that idea from the New World was helping to inform people like Karl Marx is that human beings can coexist in an equal status and can exist in the world. So that's the thesis. Primitive communalism is the thesis. But then, as predicted by Hegel, <coughs> there would be conflict, the antithesis, the antithesis. And that is the rise of, and this is the important part, class conflict. Class conflict emerges between the haves and the have-nots to start oppressing groups of people. Does it sound like the conflict theory? This is the conflict theory we're talking about, y'all. That there is a history that shifts. Romans start enslaving people, right? That was pretty oppressive. And feudalism... Uh, oppresses people, you know, the people that are the kings and the queens and everybody that's sort of the serfs. And then the peak of that conflict, the peak of the antithesis is capitalism. Capitalism is the most oppressive form of social organization because you have these people who are the rulers that he called the bourgeoisie, which was a French term that meant the owners, and the people who worked for them, the proletariat, the people who worked in the factory. So if you think of our conflict box, the people that have the power are the bourgeois uh, factory owners, and the people who don't have power are the proletarian workers, who only have their labor to sell, and therefore they are being oppressed and screwed over and forced to work in these horrible conditions. But, and this is the important but, according to the Hegelian dialectic, 
there's a third phase, right? The third phase is the synthesis that resolves that conflict. And what the third phase is, is a return to that primitive communalism, but having gone through the historical experience of class conflict. So it's not going to look like cave people, hunters and gatherers. It's going to be a modern form of communalism that he called communism. Communism was a classless society. Um, and it was the third phase of history. And for Marx, that would be the end of history. That, you know, once you've been through, you know, centuries and centuries and th thousands of years, millennia of one and millennia of another, that's it. It's the end. It's not like that starts all over again. Uh, and so in 1848, he and Engels get together because the idea of, of this is we want to get to this next phase where things are fair and th people aren't being screwed over in these factories. So they wrote a little book, a little book, almost like a pamphlet called The Communist Manifesto, 1848. And it started with these, <coughs> it opened with these words. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. These were very prophetic words because he was trying to get the workers to see that they were being exploited. They were being screwed over by the bourgeois bosses of their factories. And if they organized themselves, they could start the movement to the third phase of history to the synthesis. Uh, and the line from uh, the Communist Manifesto about what that would look like is from each according to his ability to each according to his need. That's from the Communist Manifesto. It's funny, if you go out on the street and tell people, hey, I got, I read this line, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need, where does it come from? And people will be like, the U.S. Constitution? It's from the Communist Manifesto. The idea is that you would create a classless society where you wouldn't have oppressors and oppressees. People would share equally. He talked about uh, public education. So public schools are a Marxist invention. Sorry, sorry. I know I... Communism is bad. Well, public schools are inherently communistic. Uh, that you would have a, a, a public ownership of property. You wouldn't have private ownership anymore. And everything would be owned by the collective. And this was Marx's utopian, remember, because he was influenced by the French utopians, utopian view of the world. And that would be, that would be groovy for everybody. We wouldn't be screwing each other over. So there's a couple things that are important uh, with this Marx. There's a whole bunch that's important. But one is, the question is, why can't we get to this sort of utopian view of the world? Why can't we get to this nice fantasy land that Marx sort of talked about? Well, one of the arguments that he talked about is that the workers, the people that are on the bottom being screwed over, don't have class consciousness. They don't see themselves as workers. They have what he called false consciousness. So that means instead of seeing themselves all in the same boat, they are divided. Have you ever heard the line divide and conquer? The workers are divided vertically. They're, so they may uh, be divided by religion. In Ireland, the history of the Irish conflict, you had poor Irish uh, people who were poor Catholics uh, fighting poor Protestants. And they should have been uniting together, but in fact they were being turned against each other. In America, you know, there's a lot of poor uh, people who fight against each other, including racially. The Ku Klux Klan, the racist organization of the Klan, is not made of rich white guys. It's poor white guys fighting poor black guys for the same scrap of land. You divide and conquer. And so therefore, people on the bottom can identify with the people that oppress them. There's a lot of poor, and this is Karl Marx, you know, for the 21st century. There's a lot of poor white people who think that uh, Donald Trump has their back. That he, they have more in, in, con, in conflict with this alleged billionaire than they do the guy down the street who is black or Mexican or Latino or whatever. That there is a vertical orientation. The reality from Marx's perspective is that these poor people need to get their, get unified. So what, what, how does that divide and conquer happen? How does that false consciousness happen? Well, there are a couple reasons that happen. One is... Religion. He thought religion was a big divider. One of his famous quotes is, religion is the opiate of the masses. People think, well, I'm going to get my reward in heaven. Remember we talked about this with Max Weber last video? Uh, I'm going to get my reward in heaven. I'll slave all day in this factory, and my reward will be when I die. And of course, the capitalists are like, this is great, man. Religion is the best thing ever. Let's make them have more religion, because then they'll pray and say, someday we shall overcome uh, and we'll work them to death, and then they can have the reward when they die. But in the meanwhile, we will get the um, we will get the benefit of their labor. Another thing. So religion was a big one. Another one, and this is a big one that that is really useful for Marx 
now is this concept of alienation. Alienation. What does alienation mean? Alienation means being separated from. Like a lot of us right now feel very alienated from our friends because we can't hang out with them. Or maybe you feel alienated from your family that's, that's in another country. Right? That notion of separation, that's alienation. Well, Marx talks about how capitalism, this form of oppression, the peak of oppression in the antithesis phase of history, <clears throat> creates three di different types of alienation. The first type of alienation um, is, and look, before I go through these three phases, let me sort of see if I can give you a phrase that sort of the phrase that pays with alienation. Um, have you ever felt, have you ever heard the term, you're you're just a cog in the machine. You're just a cog in the machine. What does that mean? We're just a cog in the machine. It means that you're working, you know, in some routine and it's not about you. It's about your job and you can be replaced and somebody can come along and do that exact same job and they can be the cog in the machine. So therefore, if you're like, hey, I think I should be paid more, you're out of there because somebody else will come along and be the cog in that machine. So that's, you know, the, the background background of the sort of factory work that we're talking about. And I think a lot of people, if you're working at Amazon, if you're in an Amazon distribution center, I guarantee you, you feel like a cog in the machine and you're just there to move stuff from one side of the conveyor belt to the other. That's, so that's what we're talking about. Okay, three types of alienation. The first type of alienation is being alienated from the thing that you are creating. If you really think about manufacturing in the pre- industrial revolution days before factories if you were making something you would make the whole thing if i was making vests let's say i was a fancy vest maker i used to wear vests a lot sometimes i would wear vests with no shirt underneath that was a very early 90s thing never mind uh if i were i would get i would make the fabric i would you know i don't know get the silkworms to make silk or get sheep to give me their wool, however you make fabric, and I would cut it, uh, and I would do all the parts, I would sew the buttons on, and I would add the nice glitter, whatever I was putting on my vest, and at the end of the day, I'm like, Randy's vests, for sale at Randy's store, I made the whole thing, the whole vest is my creation, I made it myself, um, I have a, a, one of um, Cozy's uh, schoolmates has a dad who makes Christmas ornaments. That's his job. He recycles old Christmas trees and makes them into Christmas ornaments all year round, and then he sells them in the holiday season. So what he's doing is he's actualizing his labor. He's putting, like an artist does, he's putting himself into this thing that he's manufacturing. They're his, like, Craig's ornaments. Uh, but when you work in a factory, you don't do that. You are on a conveyor belt. And if I'm making vests or Christmas ornaments, I'm just doing something to, you know, every vest that goes by, maybe every fifth vest that goes by, I'm putting on the top button, right? I've been turned into a machine, and I can no longer say at the end of the day, that vest, yeah, I made that vest. My labor is in that vest. No, some of those vests, I put some of the buttons on. That's the best that I can do. So I am alienated from the thing that I'm creating. I'm no longer an artist. I am just a cog in the machine. That's alienation number one. Alienation number two is, I'm alienated from my fellow workers because we're all competing for the same job and maybe to get a little bit of a promotion or get a little bit of a bonus. And so the people that I should be like rallying with because we're all in the same crappy situation together, I'm competing with. So these people who should be my friends and maybe even my family, we're all competing together. So I'm alienated from the people around me because we're all trying to get ahead and maybe screw each other over so we can get ahead a little bit. So that's alienation number two, alienated from my fellow worker. And then alienation number three is I'm alienated from myself. I can't be the person that I wanted to be. I can't be the person that, that plays to my skills. You know, maybe I'm a great singer. Maybe I should be the next American Idol, but I can't. I have to go work in this crappy factory for this crappy wage and getting my arm ripped off and trying not to lose my job to this guy next to me who's working a little bit faster than me. I can't do what I want to do, what I was meant to do, what Marx called my species being, the thing that I was most talented at giving to the world, maybe not singing, but maybe teaching or, you know, there's some other thing that I was meant to do. I can't do it because I have to work in this factory to live. I got to put food on the table for my kids. I got to pay rent. And so all I can do is work in this shitty factory. 
So I'm alienated from myself. So alienation is a thing that keeps people down. What does alienation look like? Kind of like anomie. They're very similar concepts. Alienation looks like, oh man, you know, I just got to go to work. That's all I can do and maybe pick up a few extra shifts. So that keeps the system going. Okay, but remember the light at the end of the tunnel is communism and that there will be a revolution. Remember from the conflict perspective, the change comes from the bottom. So once the people at the bottom, the workers of the world unite, because you have nothing to lose but your chains, then they can challenge the, the, the dominant system. Uh, to create a more fair and equitable system. And it doesn't have to be through violence. This is one of the things that pissed Marx off when people thought that the what he wrote in 1848 meant get guns and go kill bourgeois assholes, to go kill rich people. And this is what happened in the Russian Revolution in the, in the 19-teens, you know, the Bolsheviks. Uh, if you had clean fingernails, they would shoot you because the workers had dirty fingernails. And so how do you know if someone's bourgeois? You know, you look at their fingernails, and then if they're clean, you shoot them, and then you have the revolution. Like, that's not what Marx was talking about. He believed that capitalism sows the seeds of its own destruction and would collapse on its own, which, of course, hasn't actually happened yet. But some people think now, especially now, with the global economy the way it is, we may actually be moving to that third phase, that capitalism may be, you know, rattling in its death death knell and we may get to the next stage so that we'll, we'll see about that but the important thing about Karl Marx well there's a lot of important things about Karl Marx but one of the important things here is the idea that the economy really drives everything it drives our personal relationships it drives how we feel about ourselves and the, the ability of the bourgeois class to maintain the status quo remember that term and to, and to turn workers against each other drives racism drives sexism drives anything that divides people and keeps them fighting amongst each other instead of moving towards some type of social justice model the the synthesis that uh, marx predicted so we're going to be talking about Karl marx a lot we're going to be talking about what he is and what he isn't how he applies but i want you to think about how that three-stage uh, Hegelian dialectic fits into what we're talking about in the chalice and the blade. So we're going to come back to that, but I want that to little sink into your heads, um, and maybe we'll discuss it on a Zoom discussion. Okay, final theorists. Let's move to the symbolic interactionist level. Um, Marx is the granddaddy of conflict theorists. Let's talk about symbolic interactionism really briefly. Uh, symbolic interactionism brings things down to the micro level, and we're going to talk about, we're finally going to bring it back uh, to the United States and talk about a guy named George Herbert Mead. George Herbert Mead, born in 1863, uh, died in 1931. Uh, George Herbert Mead was interested in something that was very micro, kind of like Durkheim, you know, the suicide. Uh, Mead was interested in the concept of the self. Who are you? What's your innate, uh, unique quality? How do you think of yourself? And he wanted to talk about how the so the self is ultimately a social process. It's a product of the symbolic interaction with the, the influences around us. And he wanted to use the idea of uh, the mirror. The mirror. It's called the looking glass self. Okay, I'm going to tell you something right now. Um, I'm going to tell you something right now. I might freak you out. This is real simple. This is a real simple idea, but it is ultimately true. And uh, I'm going to tell this to you, and I'm going to assume that nobody that's watching this video is currently on LSD. Unless you're perhaps... We're all good. We're all kind of in our heads. All right. Here is this ultimate truth. You will never see your own face. You will never see your own face as it actually is. This corner, I will, probably won't see your face either. But you won't see your own face. You will only see representations of your face. You'll see your face in a mirror. You'll see your face on a Zoom video. You'll see photographs of your face and Instagrams of your face and with filters, with bunny ears. You will never actually see your face the way that somebody else can see your face. The only way you could possibly see your own face is to pluck out one of your eyes and turn it around while it's still connected to the nerve and aim it back at yourself. You will only see representations or representations of your face. Isn't that weird to think about? Like you will never see your face. You'll never see it. You'll never see it. You'll see reflections of it, but you'll never actually see it. So, uh, so he uses this idea of the mirror, that the mirror is society's reflection back at us. So I look in the mirror, I, the letter I, 
I look in the mirror and I see me when I look in the mirror. And me is not I. Me is society's reflection back at me. And you know that mirrors you know, can be weird. Like if you've ever been to a funhouse mirror, mirrors can be dirty or mirrors can be cracked. And you know, not every mirror is the same. So I'm not seeing me as I am. I'm seeing how society looks at me. And I may look in that mirror and be like, I need to gain a few pounds. I need to lose a few pounds. What happened to my hair? You know, I got a gray hair. I mean, all these things when we look at the mirror, what we're getting back is society's message of us. That the mirror is symbolic of not who we are, but how we see ourselves through society's lens. Right? We, and there's a lot of people when they look at the mirror, they don't like what they see. Why not? Because they're seeing themselves as interpreted through society's messages about what they should look like. Yeah. I mean, look at your old high school pictures. Everybody, there's always some phase, especially those of you who just got out of high school. Give it about 20 years and look at your picture like, class of 2019, you're going to go like, oh my God. Right? They're, you're just sort of looking through society's reflection. And they talked about this notion of the social self going through three, here we go, three phases by which we get to our our, our, our understanding of ourselves and how that is a social process, how we aren't just born with our personality, that it's created through the social interaction. And the, the three uh, stages of, of the development of the self have to do with play, have to do with play. What do I mean by that? Well, when babies are born, they don't really think much about themselves, right? Babies are just, ah, they want to eat, they want to sleep, they want to poop. <laughs> it's not really like, I'm really wondering if I'm an attractive person and if I have a good sense of self-esteem. Like babies aren't thinking about that stuff. But babies start this journey and it starts with phase number one, which is imitation. Babies, you know, you smile at the baby and the baby smiles back. I always think of patty cake, patty cake. I remember when our little girl you know, the first time she started realizing to do patty cake, like I can play this game with another person. So the first notion of imitation, I wave, baby waves back, right? That there are other people in the world and I can interact with them. That's phase number one. Like I'm not the only thing in the world because, you know, babies don't have object permanence. If you take, you know, a copy of Les Mis and put it behind your back, they just think it disappears. Like they're not thinking, oh, it's behind his back. Uh, and so as babies develop cognitively, uh, they start to understand there are other people in the world and they can interact with them. So that's part number one, imitation. Part number two is what we call role play. When we start pretending to be other people, cowboys and Indians, princess, my little girl likes to play astronaut, where she's like pretending to be on the moon and walking really slowly. Uh, you know, whether you're playing cops and robbers or whatever you're playing. And so this is uh, an opportunity to do two things. One is the notion that other people have other rules that apply to them. If you're playing army, which we used to play a lot when we were kids, you know, the army, you know, you have a up, or you have a right to be violent. Like you can't be violent in your life, but if you're playing soldier, soldiers are shooting each other. Or if you're playing beauty queen, there's a different way of waving. If you're a beauty queen, like you're playing that. The idea is, part number one of this is I get to play take the role of another person. And part number two is. While, while I am that person, I'm not me, and I can look back at what I'm like when I'm not that person. So I start to develop a, a sort of external sense of who I am as a person. Because while I'm playing cop, or while I'm playing beauty queen, or while I'm playing astronaut, I'm not me, and I can look back and see me, and how astronaut me is different from real me. And then third phase, according to Mead, is what he called game playing. Game playing is when we start playing by games that have rules. So my daughter loves to play uh, Chutes and Ladders and Candyland, and we're really getting into checkers, and games have rules, right? And then we can talk about kickball, we can talk about baseball, we can talk about whatever game you want to play. Games have rules. And we first start playing, I don't know if you've ever played Candyland, it's a pretty vicious game. It's like completely random. There's no skill involved. Um, that uh, at first she was just like, oh, I'm going to go to the end and win. I'm like, no, 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 you have to draw a card. And oh, yeah, you got the peppermint. That means you got to go back to the beginning. Ah! Like, you are rules. And if you play the game by the rules, then you can sort of judge, are you a good game player or not? Based on the rules of Candyland, based on the rules of checkers. Oh, I'm pretty good at that. And you start to get a sense of yourself by this thing called the rules. The rules are the abstractions. 
And the rules are the rules of society. The rules of Candyland or the rules of checkers or the rules of whatever you play. Uh, uh, we'll play lots of games. There are lots of great Mexican games, too, we play. Uh, that you uh, get to judge yourself on the basis of those rules. Society is full of rules, and those rules will allow you to judge who you are as a person. So Mead's argument is by the time the little kids start playing games with abstract rules, they start getting kind of an idea of who they are. They've been through these three phases. Imitation, there are other people in the world. Uh, role playing, I can play another role by their rules and look back at me. Uh, and then game playing with these abstract rules uh, that uh, can evaluate, help me evaluate who I am. And so his argument is through those three phases, uh, we get a kind of a starting idea of who we are, how the self is socially constructed. That's a very symbolic interactionist way of saying it, how the self is socially constructed. All right, those are some classic theorists. More to come again in Chapter 1 of Giddens. There's some other folks like Martineau and Du Bois you want to look at, uh, but those are some of our founders and sociological thought resting in our three paradigms. Okay, that is it for tonight. Uh, the next uh, topic is going to be about the methods of sociological research, how we actually do sociology, and I'll get to it whenever I get to it. All right. All right. That's all. Good night.